Good morning, everyone, and welcome to church on such a beautiful Sunday morning. We're glad. One life. Isn't it great to have the band back? Yeah. One, two, one, two, three, and four. We are all connected, a global family. There's no separation. delighted that you have joined us this morning in person or on Facebook Live or on Zoom. And for those who are, in, are here in person, please silence your cell phones now. Thank you. So let us join together in prayer. I know that there is one power, one life, only one. It is infinite. It is what I am, it is the energy and the love and the intelligence that is the substance of every single thing, being, item, whatever it is, seen and unseen. That one love and intelligence permeates each and every one of us. So I know that everyone here, each of you, is a God being right now. And that one life shows up as the spirit which is always ready to give of itself to each and every one of its creations. It is the law which absolutely is ready to make it all happen for each and every one of us. As we claim it, as we speak into that one mind which I am doing right now and each of us connected through that one mind receives the message in this prayer. And I believe deeply that we are here today to be vessels for the spirit to speak into us, uplift us, for each and every one of us to be that which blesses everyone. We are truly all blessed by every one of us being present. I know that we are blessed by all of the people who have given their time to make this church service possible. And we are blessed by our musicians and our soloists. And we are especially blessed by the divine words spoken through Dr. Mark. He has that high consciousness. He is that open vessel to speak to us clearly so that we receive that message that we each need to hear today. How blessed that we are for all of that. I am grateful for this time, for all that transpires. I am grateful for everyone here in our church community. And with my heart filled with gratitude, I release this word to the law of mind. I know it's done. <clears throat> and together we can say amen. amen. Great. 
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please remain standing for our congregational song, What a Wonderful World. going to meditate for the next five minutes. I invite you to close your eyes and silently repeat the mantra, God's the love that I am. If your mind wanders, just bring it back gently, silently repeating, God's the love that I am, and I'll bring us out of the meditation in five minutes.
Good morning. Thank you for being here. It's nice to be with you. Uh, yeah, I know. Isn't it? Great to be alive, I tell you. <laughs> so in the science of mind, you know, uh, we talk about spiritual truth all the time. And what I want to say about this is that spiritual truth, truth is very, very simple. Yeah, it is. Truth is simple. Now the execution, the application, eh, that's a little bit harder. So, you know, we are told in the Ten Commandments that we're supposed to love God, you know, really like in a big way, love God with all your heart. And so I think that's important because what we're doing is that the Old Testament is setting us up, of course, for the New Testament. And what's taking place here is that um, we're being uh, prepared to step into greater consciousness. And what I mean by that is I would ask you today, is what do you think of as the source of your good. You know, so if you think it's your job or your spouse or your house or your investments and stuff like that, we would say, mm, all of that's going to be very short-sighted. Uh, but, you know, if we know that the source of our good is God within, right, because that's really where it all comes from, our connection with the Spirit of God within us is the source of the abundance of everything everything in our life. I'm starting to teach abundance on Monday night, so I hope you will join me for that. But this is really how the principle operates. It's the awareness of our connection with God within is the source of all good in our life. 
Now, and so because we know that, because we believe that, because you know everything within us is saying yes, 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 that's so, we want to lean into that a little more. Um, we believe in the science of mind that there is, uh, because we are a metaphysical church, and what that means is that we look beyond the physical. Y yes, we're all having this physical experience, and we should pay attention to that and try to maneuver through this physical experience of life in the most intelligent way possible, but we believe that there is also a reality that is not of this world. Um, because physics actually tells us nothing in the room around us is actually solid. Oh my gosh, and I am not a sciencey person, but that's kind of wild, isn't it? That nothing in the room, although it looks really solid. I mean, you look really solid. All your molecules seem to be holding together right there where you are. And you look solid, and you look, but physics says no, that's not the case. So I realize that we are in a time where people are not loving what's going on. You know, they just don't love the way it's all working out. And people will say, and I have certainly heard these things from people in the last number of uh, weeks, I would say, that people feel lost, that they really feel a strong need for a sense of community. Um, that people tell me that I just know I'm spending way too much time on the computer. I am on the phone way too much. Um, and I look at that and I think, you know, we are, um, when things get difficult, we often, uh, we, I often will bury myself in something meaningless so I don't have to think about the difficulty, right? And, and so if I say, okay, too much uh, feeling lost and too much uh, feeling depressed and too much anxiety and all that stuff and I need a greater sense of community, I want to change it, so how? How am I going to do that? So our teaching really is about that if you love God and put that relationship with the Spirit of God that is within you, not a God that's separate or apart from you in any way, but a very living, real presence that's within you. And if we put that relationship first and remind ourselves all the time, again, again, and again, and again, and again, that that is the source of all good in my life. It's the source of health. It's the source of love. It's the source of abundance. It's the source of creativity. See, because being in right relationship with the Spirit of God within allows us, I think, to be in right relationship with other people. You know? Because that love within us is the source of the good, yes, and that love of God within us that we express where? With other people, right? In relationship with other people. So I am a fan and have been a student of uh, Joel Goldsmith for many, many years. And Gold Goldsmith talks about this a lot, that the idea of an improved humanhood is not the goal of the game, right? That's not what our spiritual journey is about, to just improve conditions in the world of effects. Ugh, darn. I'm so disappointed about that because that was such a good hook for me early on. I mean, that's one of the things that really grabbed me about the teaching. It's like, oh my God, it gets to get better. I want this. This is what I want for a church because although I loved church growing up, and I really did. I was there a lot, and I served, and, and all of that was a, was a really good experience for me. I have to say that when I left, I never felt better about myself than when I went in. In fact, I usually came out feeling worse about myself, and it's kind of amazing that I kept going back, but I knew there was something there. I knew there was something there, and actually, I remember at some point, probably in about high school, it, it occurred to me I was sitting in the church all by myself after the service was over and it was all cleaned up. And uh, I was sitting there and I had this awareness that, you know, there's more to what's going on here than what's being said. That there's what's being demonstrated in front of me, but then there is a spiritual truth that I'm going to have to go way, way back to find. And when I found science of mind, I felt like I found that truth. So. So Joel says, if we just work on an improved humanhood, well, what I know about that is that actually ultimately only increases our suffering, right? Because, because you know, we're trying to fortify the problem itself, right? <laughs> so, you know, I, I have evolved in my treatment practice, having been a religious scientist now for 40, about 40 years, I guess, uh, or close to 40 years, that in my daily treatment, I always ask, who do I need to forgive? 
Who do I need to forgive? Who do I need to forgive? And you know, there's always somebody. It was somebody on the road the other day or somebody who lives nearby who did something or the people who were repairing their unit across from mine who always blocked the driveway and I can't get out of the garage. Ah, oh, what an opportunity for spiritual growth, I'm here to tell you. Really, it is like such an opportunity. Who do I need to forgive? There's always somebody. So that's now always part of when I sit to treat. See, because I know, I know when I sit down to do the inner work, which is, you know, when I'm going to pray, when I'm going to meditate, I am willing, really I am, I am willing to open my heart. I'm open to another possibility. I'm open to seeing things different than the way I've been seeing them because clearly the way I've been seeing them is not working for me very well if I'm unhappy. Something, you know, something is wrong, I need to not numb out, right? I have to work to stay conscious. And this is what I realized is happening um, a lot in the last several years is that people do things to numb out that we don't want to feel. So, you know, the story of Job in the Old Testament is a really great story. Job is really faithful unto God. He loves God. And Job is really faithful. And Job has a pretty great life. Job's life is looking really good. You know, he's prosperous. He has a loving wife and family. You know, it's, a, it, it's pretty good from out here. It looks great. So the way the story goes is that one day, God and the devil are having a little chat in a chaw, as they tended to do in the Old Testament. And, uh, and Job and God have a little bet, really. I mean, not the devil and God have a little bet. That's what I meant to say. And, uh, and so remember, when we talk about the devil and we're talking about the characters in the Bible, all of that exists within us, right? So, so Job is us. So we just get that. And so the devil starts to mess with Job, right? And, and we can probably relate to this because it feels like everything in his life is going kind of wonky, right? It's all just going crazy. And he believes, the devil believes that Job will give up on God if things get bad enough. But Job does not. That's the incredible thing in the story, is that Job remains faithful to God, even though everything in the world of appearances, everything in his outer world comes crashing in. In fact, Neil Simon even wrote a play about this called God's Favorite, and it's the story of Job. Right? So I think, yeah, I, I, I get it. I, I, I feel like Job. I, maybe you have felt like Job lately. I can understand that. But the amazing thing in the story is that because Job remains faithful to God, he continues to do his spiritual practice, he continues to believe in God, he continues to believe in the essential goodness of God, then what happens is everything gets restored. Everything gets restored in, in the end of the story. So I think, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? Clearly, to numb out, you know, on, on the computer or watching TV or on my phone or just trying to not be aware of what's happening in the world around me, that doesn't work, right? So I think to live better, the first thing starts very early. And we've talked about this, and you've probably heard this, but I'm going to ask you to listen maybe in a different way. That first thing in the morning, your mind, my mind, is most open to being programmed. That's the time when we are most open to life-affirming, positive, uplifting messages and setting our intention for the day. Our mind is most, most open then. Right? So if we will, first thing, and, and, and I'm going to tell you, this is my confession in church, that I have slipped into a habit of first thing in the morning, I get up and I take my dog out. Because right? so, that's essential. That's why I'm up. i got to take her out, okay? That's a non-negotiable. And then I come in and I turn on the tea kettle. And while the tea kettle is heating up, I think I'm just going to take these couple minutes and I'll flip open my laptop and start to check the email, which I understand everybody gets gazillions of emails. And I'm just trying, I just want to like delete the first four or five hundred I can before my water boils, okay? And I realize that that is not the best choice I could make. Why? Because my mind being most open in the morning, right? what I have to do is I want to cleanse my mind, essentially, of yesterday. I don't want to bring any of yesterday into today's thinking. right? And I want to, this is what I realize it has to be for me. I have to not touch the electronics at all 
in any way, shape, or form until after I've done my spiritual practice. Now, that probably sounds really obvious to everybody in the room except for me. But you know how you can't see it until you can see it? And I couldn't see it until I could see it, and now I get it. It's like, oh my God. Because what I'm doing is, I, when I open my computer, what I'm doing is I'm saying, I am available to the race consciousness of the universe. I am available to everybody else's thinking, everybody else's impressions, much of which we all understand is negative, is separative. And it's like, oh, this is not the best way to continue. This is not the best way to proceed. So philosopher Blaise Pascal said that every problem in the world can be traced to man's inability to sit quietly alone. Sometimes I just don't want to sit with my own thoughts. Do you? You know, I mean, it's like I can't, I, I, like, oh my God, if I sit with this, I'm just going to, I feel like I'm going to explode, like I'm going to go crazy. So what I usually do is I usually go do something. You know, I'll take a walk or take the dog for a walk or, I don't know, take out the trash. Just do something physical, you know? And then I find after a little bit of physical, then, okay, now I can sit quietly alone. See, our mental muscles, and what I mean by mental muscles is I think our consciousness muscles have to work or we will be pulled into the negativity and the separation thinking of the world, that, that victimization that so much of the world lives in. See, so before we go anywhere or before we do anything, you know, we have to state to the universe, you know, and I have like a big post-it right on my desk because I see every month, says, may I be used for good. May I be used, so, so if I don't articulate it any other way, I know that I want to start my day with may I be used for good. I want God, I want spirit, I want love, I want the universe to work through me in a way so that somehow my presence on earth is beneficial in some way. Don't know how, don't know for who. See, before we go anywhere, I think that's really the important thing. The activity that's, that is most important at any given moment is what is going on in our mind. This is what science of mind teaches us. You know, so I, I had a revelation recently that I don't have to have an opinion. Now, this was extraordinary to me, that I don't have to have an opinion or express some thoughts about everything that happens on the face of the earth. Isn't that extraordinary? I know that's probably really obvious to everybody else, but I'm sometimes slow to get these things. And it's like, just because life is going on around me, and just because my mind is going 100 miles an hour inside, doesn't mean I have to express all of that. Now, we probably know people, I'm sure nobody here, but people we may know very well, who say everything that comes into their head. Like they have no filter at all, no filter, no boundaries, nothing. They're just a steamroller of thought that they're just gonna bleh all over you, right? Oh, it's great, it's great, you know? But this realization that I don't have to say everything, I don't have to have an opinion, I don't have to comment on everything. I mean, I mean really, this, this is a complete sentence. I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing, no, I got nothing to say to that. I've got nothing to add. You know, if it doesn't improve on the silence, I don't think I'm going to say it. It's so quiet around my house lately. <laughs> I'm here to tell you. Um, a better question, I think, to ask myself is, wh when I'm starting to have this opinion about people and what's going on in the world, is so what I really need to ask is, do I have any of that in me? Where does that live in me? Why am I so defensive around that? Why am I so against that? Do I think that if that were within me, I would be so unlovable? See, that's what I think. Our minds, I think, are so powerful that whatever we give our attention to increases. That's, a, that, that's something we teach in Science of Mind. Our minds are that powerful, you know? So if I continue to give my attention to the effects in the world that are not going well, that's going to increase. So how can I look at the world? So what I have to do is I have to uplift my consciousness before I look at any of that in the world. Hmm? I cannot be, like, think of it like this, that your consciousness, first thing in the morning, is like a newborn baby, right? 
beautiful, lovely, gorgeous, yummy, newborn baby. Oh my God, you would be so careful and tender and gentle with that little consciousness, wouldn't you? You wouldn't put it right in front of an enormous stereo system. Here you go, little newborn baby. I'm now going to turn on Metallica all the way, you know? Some serious hard rock, you know? I mean, because that would just be so, and, and we, but we're doing the same thing to our consciousness in a slightly less dramatic way when we get up in the morning and we just say, okay, what's happening in the world today? And we go, Phew! we just get overwhelmed by it. No wonder we're depressed. Really, no wonder people are as depressed. I've never heard so many people in my life tell me they are depressed, as has happened in the last 24, 30 months or so. We have to remember that whenever bad happens, it says in the Bible, and it came to pass, there has never been like a reign of terror that's lasted forever. Now, I started to talk about this a little bit last week, and I want to talk a little more about it. There's nothing spiritual about suppressing or denying how we feel. I think that people in Science of Mind have said for years through gritted teeth, I'm not angry. Really, I'm not. You know? Now, I think there's nothing spiritual about that, you know, because we're not telling the truth about how we feel. You have to tell the truth about where you are so you can then be someplace else. Right? But if you don't tell the truth about where you are, oh, right? You know, so it's like, I think it's like this. It's like, you know, God, spirit, this is how I feel. I am crazy today, but I'm really willing to not be crazy today. You know, I'm so angry about X, Y, Z, but I really want to be better. I want to be loving, right? So, so I think declaring our intention of how we want to be is a very important component. To deny it actually makes it more powerful, right? You know, because you know how when you say, I'm not angry, really, I'm not angry at all. You just turn up the heat on that burner. That's what's happening there. The heat's been turned up on the burner, and you've gone from like a little simmer to a roaring boil, right? Now be clear, it's still boiling, right? But if we stuff it and stuff it and stuff it and don't express it, ultimately we all understand what happens. We're going to explode, probably in some inappropriate way, right? So I believe that if we speak from this place within us, this place of the highest and best within us, or what I would call the Christ. If you speak from the Christ within you, the Christ in other people will always answer. Hmm? Hmm. Do I really believe that? If I speak from the Christ in me, I believe that the Christ in other people always hears that. And I believe, depending upon where people are in any moment, they respond accordingly. But the important thing is that the Christ in me is speaking to the Christ in them, and the Christ in them cannot help but hear it. Hmm. So people always ask about, in the New Testament, Jesus is going into the temple, and on his way, he's in the temple, and you know there were money changers there because people came from all over to participate in the temple. There are people there selling animals, doves, and birds for sacrifices because that was the practice at the time. And there's like a lot of business come, going on in the temple, in this very sacred, holy place. And so Jesus overturns the tables of the money changers and says, you have made a den of thieves. Out of my father's house, you have made a den of thieves. People say, well, why did he do that? And he's supposed to be Jesus. And would Jesus really do such a thing? And I don't believe Jesus did that. And I think it comes down to something very simple. He was angry. He was angry. And it's not like he was saying, oh, look what they're doing in the temple. Let me suppress that. Let me look happy. I want them to know I understand how the principle operates, so I'm going to look happy. It's like, no, I think he was angry in the moment. But you know, I think it was authentic. Then, then he moved past it. Right? So often, I think my anger has not gotten me what I needed, or what I wanted, or what my desire was. So often, I think that we don't admit to the anger that is within us, because yes, we've been taught it's bad, and we're not likable or lovable if we're angry. But I think I also just sometimes don't ex express my truth, because I don't want 
to feel like I'm putting an attacking or a non-positive, non-life-affirming energy out into the world. And so if that's so with me, that may be also so with other people, that other people don't tell the truth about things, say how they really feel, because they don't want to feel like they're attacking either. You know, but I think we've done enough spiritual work now, really I do, that we can all say, you know what, there is nothing s spiritual <laughs> about stuffing our emotions. There's no truth there. There's no love there. There's no opportunity for healing there. We are, in a we are all in relationships, right? So all that stuff comes up when you're in a relationship, whether it's a friend or a neighbor or you know, your, your closest, most intimate relationships. What we know in relationships is that over time, stuff is going to bubble up to the surface, right? Issues come up. Now, they're coming up to be healed, right? Like it says in the Bible, it came to pass. Oh, this issue's coming up. We will deal, you know, and, and if we're on track, we say, okay, how do we deal with this in an intelligent way? And then we move forward, all right? But so, so first thing I think about is, okay, something comes up. Am I willing? Am I willing to walk with you while your issue is up? Now, again, that issue is up because it's up for healing, I believe. Am I, am I safe to share the truth with you. Are you safe to share the truth back with me? You know, so often we have to go deep to heal. See, and this is why I say all the time that in the science of mind philosophy, you know, so often when people first come to science of mind, they think, oh, this is so nice. It's such a light, friendly, you know, sort of like easy 2% milk kind of <laughs> spiritual teaching, you know. And it's like, you do not know the teaching. You know, Ernest Holmes was tremendously deep. And the science of mind will take you really deep if you do the practice. You know, and so, so often, you know, when people want to heal, they don't really go to a deep place because a deep place is unfamiliar to them. They've never been there before. You know, and now they've got some condition that they really want to heal, and it's like, oh, I can't get there. I can't, I can't get there because it's unfamiliar, right? We have to feel the feelings in order to be able to grow past them, right? You know, and, and, and all that emotion that we carry, you know, we want to release that. We want to release those emotions because if we don't, Everybody understands those things, if they stay within us, they become toxic, right? And so we go to God, that is the creative problem-solving center, right? I humanly do not know what to do in this situation, but I know that God does. I will turn to that power and presence now. See, humanly, we want to figure it all out before we give it to God. And what science of mind says, you know, is you're going to give it to God first, and that's how it's all going to get figured out. Right? Because you, you can see one way humanly. Right? Usually we say, well, it has to work out this way. If it doesn't work out this way, I don't know how it can work out. And God says, I have a million ways for it to work out that you cannot even imagine yet. See, So the practice that I want to encourage us in, in the days and week ahead, is something very, very simple. We do in classes often something that we call the love prayer. And it goes like this. I accept you and I bless you. Or I accept this situation, and I bless this situation, right? But now my upgraded love prayer, we're going to take it a little further. So we start with accepting, and then we go to blessing. So I accept you. I bless you. Now, I forgive you. I release you. I accept you. I bless you. I forgive you. I release you. What a mantra. I mean, Sam, can you put that to a beat or something? I like that. You know, really, it'll be a, he'll, he'll make a song. It'll be here next week, I'm sure. You know what I mean? <laughs> but this is what we need to be saying in these situations to ourselves when we're doing our practice. I accept this. I, now, accept it doesn't mean I agree with it. You know, if I accept you, and you're behaving crazy, it doesn't mean I agree with your crazy behavior. It means I accept that this is just where you are right in this moment. Right? I accept you. I bless you. I forgive you. I release you. Right? I want you to say that with me now, and we're going to do it three times together. Do you remember? I accept you. I bless you. I forgive you. I release you. Think of someone. Got it? That's who. That's exactly the right person. If you can't think of anybody else, use me. Here we go. I accept you, I bless you, I forgive you, I release you. I accept you, I bless you, I forgive you, I release you. 
I accept you, I bless you, I forgive you, I release you. I don't care who you are in relationship with, who you are doing this on behalf of. If you do this enough sincerely, something in you will shift. Because you know you can't put truth in, truth in, truth in, truth in, and not eventually have truth come out. Now, sometimes it takes a while before the water runs clear. We all understand that. But this is really powerful. Remember, the great spiritual masters that have been on the face of the earth did not come to teach a spiritual truth that is so complex you have to have multiple PhDs to understand. They came to teach something very simple, and if you did something very simple consistently, it would transform your life. I accept you, I bless you, I forgive you, I release you. You know who you need to do that for. And right now is the perfect time to be doing that. Remember, Job stayed true to what he knew about God. And in the end, everything that appeared to be taken away was restored to him. I think... Um, we all experience lots of cruelty, you know? Um, we experience lots of not truth. We experience lots of not the best in other people, not the light. Um, and I think when we start to have that experience, we're so averse to it. We want to move away from it so much, which I think is actually the opposite of what we need to do to have healing. If I would experience it fully, then I believe that spirit within us can lead us past it. But until I experience it, then um, uh, I'm distant from it. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to be resolved in any way. What people, I feel, uh, and I have heard again and again, is that... Um, you know, people love this idea of spiritual, you know, that things look spiritual. Oh, it's so spiritual, it's so spiritual. And I think, well, that, that can be a trap, though. You know, like, because people will say, well, I didn't want to say this to them because I thought it might be hurtful, and that's not spiritual. Well, it depends where in you you are saying it from. Mm -hmm. you, you can say hello to somebody with the intention of hurting them, and they'll be devastated, right? We all get that. We understand that. But like, where, in, where do I share maybe something difficult with somebody I really care about? Where do I share that from? Because again, if we can experience it fully, spirit can lead us past it, right? So I think we have to be truthful, feel it, get in touch with it, express it honestly, and see how the universe responds. So I'll ask us now, let's all turn our attention inward for a moment. Close your eyes and bring your awareness to the pattern of your breathing. And so just notice with me that right here, the fullness, the allness of God, infinite loving spirit is present right where we are. And so as I say this in the first person, it's for every one of us. So claim it for yourself. I am willing to change. I'm willing to change my mind. Infinite spirit, I am willing to change my heart. Presence of love and light, I am willing to change the perception of myself and the world around me. I'm willing to change what I do and how I do it. I'm willing to change and to be changed and to see the miraculous change that change brings. So I know this morning that I of myself can do nothing, that it's truly the Father, Mother, God within, the presence of the living spirit that does the work. Therefore, I am willing to allow this presence of spirit to heal and change me at the soul level, that I may be all that God created me to be, and that I might see other people as all that God created them to be. I declare for myself that I am an open, willing vessel, willing to be transformed, to have my true mind restored, and to have my heart renewed according to God's perfect plan. So I declare that healing is happening now, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. 
I accept healing on all levels. And on all levels, I know when I affirm that I am now healed. And as I know this for myself, I know this for all the people that I love and care about, those I hold near and dear, parents and children. And we see them in our mind's eye, and we wrap our arms around them, knowing that all is well, that they are blessed, that they are healed, they are supplied, they are at peace. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in, a world that is just screaming for our love. And I know we have something of tremendous value to add into that. And we do that now. We bless our church. We bless all churches, synagogues, and temples, and mosques, and ashrams, all paths to God. And I know that we are blessed by being together, that there is tremendous raising up today. And we say yes to it. So with an open, gracious, full heart, I say thank you, God, that this is the truth. I release this word into law, and so it is. Together we all say, amen. All right, we'll sing one time together. I invite you to hold your gift over your heart and we'll say our statement of giving together. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. Thank you very much. That's a good morning. Right? I'm not bringing my bucket to an empty well. Or reliving those heartbreak stories I keep wanting to tell. Excuse to be afraid and weak. So I'm using my big girl voice to get up and speak. Come on. And I'm saying enough is enough.
sisters and brothers, yeah. The joy we reap is the love we've sown. And the only life we live is our very own. That was awesome. Gia Chambada, thank you so much. You, you can get Gia's music on iTunes and uh, plan to do that. And let's, we have the whole band here today. It's awesome. Thank you to our band. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Bob Crosby on sax, flute, and alto flute. We don't mess around around here. Charlie Steen. Thank you for doing that, Sam. I didn't, I didn't have all the names. <laughs> Thank you. Great band. Okay, we have some announcements, and let's see what they are. Okay, so if this is your first time at our church, we are delighted that you're here. Please stop the, by the welcome table on the patio to pick up a packet of information just for you. We make it easy for you to make donations to our church. The text to give number and QR code are on your program, or you can go to our website, <clears throat> nhcrs.org slash give, G-I-V-E, give. Prayer with a practitioner is available after service in person here. Practitioners will be in front of the sanctuary or on Zoom. Um, and so Wednesday evening, we have this fabulous service with Reverend Sidney Steen, Charlie Steen's wife. And the meditation starts at 6.50 p.m. The service is at 7 p.m. Join Reverend Sidney this week as she shares on the topic, Are You Ready to Receive? I hope so. The Abundance Workshop 2022 with Dr. Mark Vieira, the first four Mondays in August on Zoom only. Dr. Mark brings over 30 years of experience and wisdom to this amazing workshop where you'll learn how to expand your prosperity consciousness. The class will be from 6.30 to 8 p.m. and will be based on the book Spiritual Economics by Eric Butterworth. Sign up today on our website and the cost is responsible giving. Walk the labyrinth. Come one and come all and support your soul, your soul, with the peace and blessings of the labyrinth walk. Friday, August 19th, 6.30 p.m. orientation and explanation for first time walkers and the walk will be from 7 to 9 p.m. and also Saturday, August 20th, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. healing walk. If you would like to volunteer to support this ministry, please sign up on the patio. 
We have a Zoom virtual patio before and after Sunday and Wednesday services and a Zoom meditation every morning, Monday through Saturday from 7.55 to 8.15 a.m. <clears throat> and you can visit our website, nhcrs.org, to obtain Zoom links and more information about all of our events and to sign up for weekly e-blasts and monthly newsletters. So now please stand and join in singing do our peace on. <laughs> So please repeat after me. I'm at home in the heart of God. My life is anchored in truth. I can never be separate. I live in the consciousness of peace. I release all fear. I am living love. Amen. Thank you.